This video is a reflection inspired by a number of tweets by Matthew Pajot about the cycle of renewal and the fruit from the tree of knowledge. Additionally, it is also a lengthy response to a comment by Snake was right under the previous video, which I weren't able to address in just a few words. There is a time to tear down and a time to build, a time for war and a time for peace. And this way, the universe may prevail in a dance to that rhythm, the harmony of the spheres. But what happens if you have the knowledge about that rhythm, and thus the power to alter it? What if you could induce a change faster than it's due, or conversely, defer it indefinitely? If you think about it, this is what we try to achieve with technology all the time. Save time and push away the influence of its passing. But the world we live in is not created by us. It has its rules whose breaking has consequences. You would think that saving time through technology is a great thing, but it turns out that all that amassed time you manage to harvest poses an existential threat to the extent that it needs to be killed effectively lest you die. Oh, and we have plenty of technology to annihilate any amount of saved up time, trust me. Let's try a couple of examples. You're traveling to the other end of the world from your culture to a completely foreign one. If you took enough time to get there you would see and be able to digest how the culture changes ever so slightly, custom by custom, word by word, shade by shade. But if you decide to travel by plane and get there within, say, 10 hours, you are likely to experience a so-called culture shock. You can even be scandalized or, in, in certain cases, killed by this new reality. This isn't to say that we shouldn't move forward. In fact, it is our mission to digest, to consume potential bit by bit and transform it into habitable order. But imagine being faced by a mountain of cake all at once and you are forced to eat it. It terrorizes you, horrifies you. It makes you angry. Or maybe you learn that you are a grandson of your nemesis and a supposed puppet in the hands of something way bigger than yourself. Or that the secluded island you live on is just a small part of a huge cruel world in which your nation has been persecuted for generations. Paul Muad'Dib and Aaron Yeager are great examples of what happens when you are faced with a mountain of cake or if you stare into the endless void, if you will, or eat the fruit from the tree without proper training in virtue beforehand. Consider the words of Carl Jung expressed by Jordan Peterson in this clip. Jung told people, he talked about mescaline and LSD in the context of Huxley's introduction of those substances into the Western world. And he said two things in his inimitably wise manner. The first thing he said is, beware of unearned wisdom. <laughs> it's like, yeah, man, that's great. And he also said, you, you have to be very careful about, about entering the realm of the gods because you end up with a responsibility that might be more crushing than you can tolerate. Or maybe Jonathan and Matthew can make it more meaningful to you. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you could say, yeah, it has two faces is a good way to see it, is that if you approach it properly, if you approach it with reverence and gratitude and with the right insight, then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil leads to the tree of life. This is something that St. Ephraim, for example, says, is that if, the, if Adam and Eve had received the fruit from God as was planned, instead of taking it for themselves, then they would have known evil as a healthy person knows sickness.
right? As someone who is in the good and can see evil. Uh, but because they took it with arrogance and they took it upon themselves, then they know good as someone who is evil. They know health as someone who is sickness, in sickness. That they try to take facts into their, include facts that they didn't know what to name, how to explain with their theories. That's really what it means. So when you eat something that you can't handle, it, that's, that's the miniature version of a bigger picture where you see things that you don't know how to name. You yeah. can't name. You can't identify. Yeah, and that has something to do with when Jordan Peterson is always talking about this, this, this kind of entry into chaos where you know you you face something which disrupts you what you know. It's like, and all of a sudden you you don't know. Like he talks often about this idea that you know you find out that your spouse has been cheating on you for ten years, and so that 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 like that hitting of of a, of of a fact or a, something that you can't handle you know throws your whole world up into upheaval and it's like everything is on the verge of of, uh, of of falling apart and so then you have to you have to work at putting things together like you have to yeah. it's like it, it needs the work to to bring things back you have to, to fix cohesive. things yeah exactly you have to fix things make them fit your mind again make yeah. them fit your your plans let's say you have plans yeah something happens that isn't part of your plan and you don't know what to do with yeah. it 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 makes you wander. Heaps of knowledge that you are not ready to digest and transform can be the bane of yours if you're not prepared or in a proper disposition. That disposition boils down to a few key virtues, faith and hope that there is meaning hidden in, in all these atrocities that there is a plan for justice to be served, fortitude and temperance to withstand the chaos flooding you as long as it is necessary and withhold your countermeasures until the situation has ripened. We can simplify it by boiling it all down to patience. Be careful not to mistake the ability to deliver cold-blooded vengeance for real patience as the latter might require you to take part in a plan that goes beyond your lifetime, so we will not be there anymore to witness justice being properly delivered. If you are not ready for this, the pseudo-justice that you are going to achieve will strike back at you with even greater force, putting you in the vicious circle of endless retribution. Okay. You clicked on this video, hoping to get some analysis of Attack on Titan in Dune. If you survived until now, you already displayed more patience than, than our two protagonists. Let's start with Eren. A Christian watching AOT gets first glimpses of what's coming up, when Eren strongly states that he's going to kill all Titans. But lack of patience starts earlier in the story with Marley sending out a team to retrieve stolen attacking Titan. Their unnecessary assault pushes Grisha to start acting. Otherwise, he would have died very soon anyway, and the power of attacking Titan would have probably returned to one of Eldian's slaves in Marley, solving the problem. We've seen lack of patience as a tragic flaw all throughout the history of storytelling, from Genesis, through ancient Greek plays, the works of Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, to Attack on Titan. Indeed, when Aaron touches Historia, he learns about the, well, history, things past and future, and it's obviously too much for him to handle in one bite. He discovers that Eldians are not just innocent victims of Titan's terror, but are in fact those very titans. And they themselves used to spread violence and death across the globe. It scandalizes Aaron, shocks him, to the extent that he cannot escape it and become a slave to that vision of himself as an Eldian, a brutal mur murderer of whole nations. 
Since that moment, he had to play the role. We do see an example of proper handling of knowledge in the characters of the Rice family. The blue sparkling eyes of the wielder of the founding titan represent true enlightenment, that is the ability to handle knowledge, patience, beyond Grisha and Aaron's understanding. How would the story end if Eldians from Paradis managed to stick within action? As we've already established, Drinking the water of life is Paul's equivalent of Aaron's kissing Historia's hand. We could also say that he discovers very similar things about his ancestry and thus himself. He also reacts in the same way as Aaron. Scandalized by that discovery, he sees no other way than to play along, despite claiming to have visions of every possibility. Not unlike it was the case with Aaron, we learn about Paul's hot-headedness beforehand, when he admits to be aiming for the revenge on the Harkonnen. Imagine a situation though, where he doesn't drink the water of life and keeps disrupting the harvests, even pushed back to the southern hemisphere. The Fremen had been a major problem to the Harkonnen even before. Now, united under Paul, they could probably disrupt the flow of the spice much more to the point where the noble houses become tired and restless and would welcome the idea of Paul taking over. The Jihad would be unnecessary, in the same way as Aaron could have avoided the rumbling. It is worth noting here that Baron Vladimir represents the other side of the coin here. He doesn't accept the passing of time and wants to stall the cycle of change, completely missing the chance it could present to him as his successor, who would be his grandson after all. If we wanted to look for the Rice family equivalent in the Dune universe, it would probably be the Bene Gesserit, who understand the wisdom of Ecclesiastes, that there is time for everything and that patience is the way. Their plans outlive Paul and all of his descendants, and none of the sisters displays the urge to see them fulfilled during her lifetime. Compare Paul to the Biblical King David. Both are given authority by their superior and want to take what's rightfully theirs, but are being denied it by their predecessors. But David, despite ample opportunity to strike down King Saul, decides to wait patiently, trusting that justice will find its way. Because of that, he doesn't end up being a murderer of the good King Saul, but rather the king himself devolves and deteriorates, trying to prolong his cycle and becomes a mockery of his former self. Apart from one significant event, King David always respected the cycles, the time necessary for things to ripen. So he did not build the temple even though he could have done so. This way, he became a model king for Israel, everyone tried to live up to. One last thing before we finish this video. Remember how I said in the last video that Paul Muad'Dib is like Barabbas, a militant messiah that Israel was expecting? You see, Christ was that messiah as well. After all, he managed to subjugate the Caesar and make him bow down to his will. It's only that it took a bit more time than some of the Jews were willing to wait. Thanks and see you in the next video.